and welcome back to Duke's Copy TV. You've joined us for another programme of Holmbeck Unleashed. Dr Frank has joined us in the studio once again to talk about the IMF. Dr Frank, thank you so much for joining us. I'm glad to be here. Dr Frank, recently the IMF published a paper looking back at the Chicago plan, but what is the Chicago plan? Um, this plan is brilliant. Uh, I love this plan. It's like a giant reset button on the world economy. We currently have a problem of too much private and public debt and we hope to solve the problem with no debt. That's a bit like uh, throwing gasoline onto a bonfire. Okay? And with one bold stroke, this plan would essentially replace uh, money with debt without the negative consequences of printing money. It would also significantly reduce the amount of private and public debt. Now, this scheme of massive uh, debt forgiveness is actually not something new. Uh, the Athenian leader, uh, Solon, actually implemented the first Chicago plan back in 599 BC. Now, this plan, and there are several different versions, was actually developed in the 20s and 30s by the leading economists of the time. A version of the plan was actually put on Roosevelt's desk in 1933. Now, these uh, economists recognized that it was a rapid expansion and contraction of credit, unjustified by what was happening on the ground, that was leading to these booms and busts. And that is because a bank can create a loan and then finance it out of thin air through the fractional reserve banking system, something no other business can do. Of course, central bank adding an unnecessary liquidity just made things worse. Now, an essential feature of all of the different Chicago plans is that the uh, banks would be required to hold 100% reserves. This means essentially that we would have a separation between deposit banking and loan banking, something that I've suggested on many other interviews. Views. Now, the beauty of the plan is actually in its implementation. Today, banks in the U.S. have to hold 10% reserves against deposits. According to the IMF version of the Chicago plan, banks would receive treasury credits or money to bring their reserve requirements from 10% to 100%. Then the government would essentially cancel all of the government debt and most of the private debt against ownership of these credits. Let me explain. It's basically uh, an asset swap. The banks would receive uh, interest-free money from the government and the government would essentially get back all or essentially almost all of the bank's uh, debt instruments. Now, the banks couldn't really do anything with this money since they now have a new 100% reserve requirement. Now, the IMF paper uh, indicated that the U.S. government could reduce most of the private debt by about $15 trillion. Okay? Now, you can imagine there are going to be a lot of happy people. For example, you have a student loan and you have credit card loans and you have a car loan and you have a home mortgage. And under this plan, you wake up one morning and your debt slate has been wiped clean. You don't owe anybody any money. Okay. Now, of course, people who are frugal and didn't take on an excessive amount of debt would be somewhat upset. But I'm sure that the government can compensate them somehow since the government will be in a position of largesse. Now, once uh, this um, exchange has been made, banks will be allowed to only hold uh, investment loans. This is to finance uh, buildings and plants and equipment. In the future, banks would only be allowed to finance themselves either through equity or through government loans. Uh, private debt instruments would cease to exist. Now, this is a very important part of the plan because uh, past attempts to separate deposit banking from loan banking failed because banks were able to create what I call near monies. Now, a near money is essentially a demand deposit in a different colored dress. For example, a money market mutual fund. So what conclusions were drawn from the IMF paper, Dr. Frank? Well, Irving Fisher, uh, a Yale economist, and someone Milton Friedman called America's greatest economist, said that the plan would significantly reduce the severity of business cycles, almost eliminating booms and busts. It would also make bank runs impossible, making deposit insurance unnecessary. It would also significantly reduce the amount of public and private debt. 
Now, the IMF paper using uh, state-of-the-art economic modeling agreed with Dr. Fisher. And this paper also indicated that the plan would have two additional important benefits. GDP growth would surge initially by 10%. This is due to the elimination of many distortions. Also, inflation could be kept at zero. The reason is that central banks would have greater control over the money supply so that they, so that they could follow a monetary rule that would keep monetary growth uh, in line with growth in the economy, therefore keeping prices stable. So lastly, Dr. Frank, if this plan was implemented, what changes would you make to it? If we can implement a version of this plan, I would be absolutely thrilled. Uh, I would only make three small changes. Uh, the first one is I would uh, separate the deposit function from the loan function. I do not believe that these functions can coexist in the same entity. So I would have uh, deposit banks and investment trusts. Secondly, I would have the central bank follow a monetary rule of zero growth in the money supply. In other words, I would eliminate the central bank. For me, every dollar that the central bank prints is a tax, a tax that no one has voted for. So my world would be a world of deflation as we saw in the 19th century. Of course, I would actually prefer a gold standard because I do not believe that the government can follow a monetary rule. There's simply too much of an incentive to print money to finance government expenditures. Thirdly, I would not have the government fund banks. Uh, in the Chicago plan, government funding was to allow it to fiddle with interest rates. I do not think that the government should be manipulating prices. And the interest rate is the most important price in the economy. It's the price of time. And that reflects the intertemporal desire to consume today relative to consuming tomorrow. The markets should be the ones setting interest rates. Now, the Chicago plan failed in the 1930s because the banking cartel killed it. We're in a different situation today because most people blame banks for creating the monumental mess that we're in today. Now, if we can get academic economists to uh, back some version of this plan, as most academic economists did in the 1930s, then with public support, we can force a banking cartel, obviously screaming and kicking, to the altar of 100% reserve banking. Banking. I do believe that it's the solution to our current world debt problem. So I urge your viewers to learn more about the Chicago plan to get the world out and let's start a banking revolution before it's too late. For me, too late would be another disaster like World War II. So thank you, Dr. Frank, for coming in and sharing your insights with us once again. You're welcome. That's all from us in the Duke's Copy Studio, but just click back to the website for more interviews and updates. I'm <laughs> sorry.